it's interesting in all the readings this morning, good morning everybody, there's a lot about what we see. And the most beautiful one is in the Psalm 27. I long to see your face, O Lord. Where's that longing coming from? From the depths of our heart, because we were made in his image and likeness. We long to see our parents, our siblings, close friends. We long to see your face, O oh Lord. We belong to him, his we are. It's good to be with the Lord. And that applies to times of joy, but also times of, of distress and sorrow, confusion, crisis, danger, loneliness. So many different states we can be in. Long to see your face, O oh Lord. Sometimes people would suggest that the synagogues were only used for discussion, that kind of academic debate, discussion. And there's no question about it that they definitely had that kind of activity. But when you read a psalm, like Psalm 27 in the synagogue, I long to see your face, O Lord. That's already a prayer in itself. There has been kind of a theory that they weren't praying in the synagogues, that they were just community gathering rooms. But if they had the scriptures, so many passages of the scriptures are prayer. So I think there's room for considering that there was prayer in the synagogues. Sometimes guides say that at our synagogue there was no prayer, that the prayer was done in Jerusalem, but believing people are always praying. It's no surprise if a believing person turns to God every day. And in fact, people who are conscious of God's presence are in contact with them continually. That's just normal. To live. God created the world and I believe that and my life depends on him. Then, and I know the stories of God's people, then I will be turning to God. And there's a, a great teaching about thanksgiving and also about asking for forgiveness. And we have so many things to thank, be thankful for and so many things, and so many uh, occasions to need to ask for forgiveness. I long to see your face, O oh Lord. And that's what Elijah does. He runs off to Mount, Mount Sinai after the big crisis, if you read earlier in the chapter, chapter 19 of the first book of Kings that we're reading, you'll see that Ahab related everything that happened, that big crisis on Mount Carmel to his wife Jezebel. And she immediately threatened Elijah's life. So he's fleeing, he's in danger of his life. And he's going to Mount Sinai. He also feels very alone. He's probably really depressed. He's carried out very violent action. 
who knows if that was not just a lot of human resolution at the moment. And he needs to go and find God to process all of this. And God says to him, why did you come? <laughs> What's your problem? <laughs> Why did you come here? And he says, and uh, where are you? Where are you in your life? In your life's goals? And if you keep reading in the text, God speaks about the thousands that he has kept in fidelity. But Elijah feels very alone. And so that contact with God brings him back to the truth of himself where he is. That he's held by God. He doesn't need to be afraid. And then there's a great teaching in in the gospel passage about our sight and our eyes. We're body and soul. And we're connected, we're one mystery of God's love and creation and his genius to create us the way he did. If we break a couple of spokes in a bicycle, it can cause a problem. For start, there's noise, but then it can lead to other problems, a weakening of the wheel. And in our interior disarray through sin, all that's gone before us and all that we do, we can be messed up a bit inside. And the law began to order the society. Do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not cheat, do not lie, do not go after your neighbor's wife. And that works vice versa. Don't go after your neighbor's husband. Don't go after somebody who's consecrated to God. Horrible, messy. And then Jesus takes it to a deep level than just don't commit murder. And we had that yesterday in dealing with anger. And today in the area of sexuality, it's not just about not committing formal prescribed sins, but physically, but Jesus brings it to the level of the heart. What do you desire? And it comes through the eyes because this is a very bodily area the sins of sensuality with our senses, the sins of lust. It's through the eyes things are seen and that creates a chain of reactions. And those desires are in the heart. But the way we see people, the way we look at people. And then we have this other wonderful line in the Sermon on the Mount that we had at the opening of chapter five of the Gospel, blessed are the pure of heart, they will see God. I long to see your face, the pure of heart. The purity of heart also includes other sectors besides sexuality, but it's also incredibly true of sexuality. So the way we see others, the way we desire others. When we see others, we have to see the image and likeness of God. We have to see a future saint that's going to be in his glory forever. We're going to see somebody that maybe needs my prayer, my help to grow as a teacher teaching, as a doctor providing health care. I can do many little things, teach a child how to write and to read, but actually I'm teaching somebody who's going to be a saint forever in glory. 
I'm helping somebody's health situation who's called to be a saint forever in glory. What do I see when I see a person? And our advertising world and our depravity today, our decadence, our debauchery, human trafficking, the incredible levels of indulgence, uh, actually put up a whole tendency in society to see people just from their physical looks, from their attractivity, from their desirability, and also in a lustful way. And it comes from both sides. It comes from the men and the women. And then if each one knows that we're a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, we're a temple of God. We're created for holiness. We belong to God. We have this awesome gift of being sexual beings endowed with the extraordinary, amazing gift of procreation to bring another human being to life within the context of marriage. Because the child needs that and each, the, the, the parent, the spouse is also. All through the period of labor, of, of pregnancy and labor, how much that mother needs her spouse needs the father of that child to be there because they both are responsible for the child. So we need a lot, we have a lot to do in our culture today to also communicate these great values in the best way that parents really communicate to their children is the way they treat each other because that models it for the children and so there's kindness and goodness and forgiveness and patience and that's the best way for the kids need to learn the theory about kindness and goodness and patience and mutual respect and care and gentleness but they, they need to see it happening in their parents and in their older siblings in their classmates and people at work the way they dress at work the way they the conversation levels the innuendo it's the innuendo of a person united and inspired by the redemptive grace that's given to us to deal with all of our challenges and issues. So the readings today are very powerful to help us to have an education, a culture of sight, a sight that's filled with godliness, with goodness, with beauty, with the recognizing the gifts of the Creator, treating them with that wonderful respect, because He is present everywhere. It's His gift. Behind every gift is a giver. Whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me. And that takes in the spirit of Elijah, who puts his head in his cloak. That's an interesting image that came up yesterday as well. And it's that person that's, that's uh, wanting to be connected interiorly with God. We can also open our eyes and be connected interiorly with God, but we need little exercises to help us. People, that's a lot for today. Thank you for coming along on the stroll this morning, sunrise stroll and chat. God bless you. See you later, alligators. Tomorrow I will uh, let you know about a little change in program. Uh, God bless you.